for more than a decade and a half, who was even serving the board. He has the discovery of the supernova 1994i in his resume, and uh, he's now a college professor of education. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Douglas Miller. After I, I talk, <laughs> Chris, I think that's the best talk I've ever, the best up, what's up I've ever heard. Absolutely amazing. Well done. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Okay. I think we need to start with the first slide. Check one, two. I need a little more volume. Okay, so we're going to talk about hydrogen alpha observing tonight and divide the talk into two pieces. One is uh, some theory, and, uh, and the other is uh, some practical stuff of uh, what kind of equipment to use, uh, assuming you haven't decided to use any hydrogen alpha gear. Uh, I wanted to give you some pointers about what, to, uh, what you might want to get. Um, I've written the talk about three times because uh, things have changed so much. The, uh, in the middle of writing the talk, the Solar um, Dynamics Observatory went up, and uh, people just threw their books in the fire. And so every time I asked a question about something to Don Lynn, my lifeline, I said, well, that's true, but uh, things have changed. So, okay, all right. <laughs> well, some other things have changed, too. Normally, if you buy a solar filter and put it on the front of your telescope, you get a white light picture. Wait a minute, that's not white. Well, people take their white light pictures and color them. So they look like the sun. This is supposed to be white. And uh, this is about what you see with white light, some little uh, um, modeling on the sun, very little granulation, and of course you get pretty good pictures of the sunspots. And that's okay. Uh, but if you want to go into uh, hydrogen alpha viewing, things are a little more exciting. Now I admit this is from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. It's changed everything. And this is a movie. But you can take your hydrogen alpha telescope and take a picture every minute or two or every 10 minutes and make your own GIF images and make a movie out of it. You notice that you're seeing prominence, prominences around the edge. You're seeing granulations uh, on the surface. And as we'll see, a lot more. This is a, a busier day on the sun. This was a couple of, about a week ago. There was a filament that stretched all the way around the sun, about half the, about half the diameter of the sun. Uh, and this is the low end of the sunspot cycle. So things will get more exciting, I think. Um, hydrogen alpha, is, I had to look this up because I thought I knew what it meant and it, I didn't. It's a particular, a particular Balmer series electron jump by hydrogen that produces radiation at 656.28 nanometers. The convention is to use things in nanometers, but the tradition is to talk about things in angstroms. We'll stay with nanometers. It's a very short, we need the light over here, a very short wavelength. A nanometer is uh, 10 to the minus ninth meters, so it's really short. Uh, KNX, uh, wavelength of KNX is uh, 300 meters. Uh, FM radio stations are three meters. Um, let's see, regular radar is um, six centimeters. The uh, new uh, crowd dispersal radar is three millimeters. And and that's 90 gigahertz. And hydrogen alpha is 656 nanometers. So basically, if you take your eyeball and the nerves in your brain, you've got a pretty good lens antenna. You've got a detector at 656 nanometers. Uh, I hesitate to say fiber optics. Uh, to the signal processor, which puts out a high definition, full motion TV in what could be called the PAL system. Okay, that's as funny as the talk gets, okay. <laughs> um, we limit our viewing to hydrogen alpha because it gives us the best detail. It's fairly simple to make uh, a telescope that'll, that'll bring that energy out. It's bright, and we get to see lots of things. There are other frequencies you can view the sun at from 12 kilohertz up uh, into x-rays, but hydrogen alpha seems to be the place where most of the fun happens and most of the good viewing is. 
And these are the regular statistics. White light picture of the sun again. The sun is 93 million miles from the Earth, eight and a half light minutes away from us. Uh, it's about 100 Earths across, four and a half billion years old. 99.8% of the mass of the solar system. And mostly hydrogen, a little bit of helium. It's approximately 5,000 degrees um, Kelvin, actually. But uh, it varies depending on exactly where you're looking and the coronal temperature is two million degrees, and nobody knows why that's hotter than the, in, the uh, farther in layers. I'm gonna check my notes again. Okay, those are, those are statistics that come out in every astronomy book that you look at. And as I thought about them, I came up with some things that may be uh, more challenging. When we think about Orion, for instance, you know when it comes up that where it is. You tell your, your uh, telescope, uh, what time it is, where you are, and that it's level, and uh, you want to look and you do the alignment and you say go to Orion, you go right to the object, it hasn't changed. Things don't seem to move a lot out there in space. And you get the feeling, and, uh, like the ancients did, that the, that the cosmos is immutable, somehow perfect and, and very static. And even if you look at the sun, you look at things and they change day to day pretty much. What you're looking at is a function of distance, because the uh, solar system, for instance, is, uh, is going around the galaxy at 220 kilometers a second. So we're not only spinning quite fast and going around the sun quite fast, the whole kit and caboodle is going around the galaxy at 220 kilometers a second. It takes us 225 million years to go around the galaxy. That's one galactic year. Okay, so let's see, if I'm 60, let's say I'm 60 years old, and I want to know how old I am in galactic years. In the galactic years, 225 million years, some of you guys that are Mensa category mathematicians, can you figure out how old I am? Is my mother just having morning sickness? Uh, am I a couple of weeks old? Well, if you figure it out, raise your hand, and, and I'll, I'll call on you. Um, yeah, okay. We're also looking into the past. The light from the sun takes eight minutes to get here. So whatever is really happening at the sun at the same instant we think about it, it takes eight minutes to get here. We have no idea what's happening on the sun. In fact, light takes, uh, it, it travels one foot in one nanosecond. So if I'm looking at Reza at 10 feet, he's 10 nanoseconds ahead of me. Well, I'm seeing you 10 nanoseconds later. So you could be entirely different. You could be, you know, and I wouldn't know about it till 10 nanoseconds later. And the guys back in the booth, they could be having a party, and I wouldn't even know about it for 60 nanoseconds. So, so in a sense, we're all looking into the past in a giant time machine. Very interesting. Um, the sun is so large and so powerful that there aren't very many uh, ways we can think about it that are intuitive. As the, as the particles take, not even particles, because the sun is so hot that all the atoms are thrown apart into plasma and ionization. There's no, uh, there's nothing there, just stuff. As it gets out and cools down, it recombines. And when, it, when the temperature gets to 5,000 degrees Kelvin, the hydrogen recombines. And you get hydrogen, which makes what looks like a surface at that point. What you get is an isothermic layer. That term means that it's the same temperature, at that same temperature, all around the sun, you get visible hydrogen. The sun then, if you look at it in a different frequency, like iron nine in X-rays, which is much hotter, means that it's uh, more energetic, often X-rays, hotter, and the sun at that time is smaller. It co combines into iron nine sooner than it does to hydrogen alpha. And so what you see is a slightly smaller sun, not a hugely smaller sun, but slightly smaller sun. And you're looking deeper into the sun at that point, I think. The photosphere, even though it looks like a hard surface, I said was a gas, it's um, the same density as our atmosphere at 44 miles, 230,000 feet. The photosphere is nearly a vacuum on the sun, but the sun is 
so large that it looks like a solid surface. So as I say, there's a lot of things about the sun that seem intuitive, but are not. Um, the uh, sun ten tends to work in 11-year cycles um, of sunspots. You'll, you'll have uh, half, the, half the time of the 11 years the sun is active and sunspots and coronal mass ejections and so forth. And then for the other half, it tends to quiet down. And we're in a quiet period right now. And it's starting last spring, more so this fall, and much more so, I think, this spring. We're heading steeply into the next solar cycle. So if you're thinking about getting a hydrogen alpha telescope, this is the time to get one. We're heading into a very active period in the solar, uh, in the life of the sun. And you'll see wonderful things. I think Helen and I got ours about in the year 2000. So we came right in the beginning of the last solar cycle, and we took it out every day. There was stuff to see, and, and we saw lots of interesting stuff, including the largest coronal mass ejection ever seen. Uh, it, was, it was quite nice. For some reason, the activity peaks in the spring and in the fall on the Earth, that, that the best times to go out and do uh, complicated observing are spring and fall, although the sun is probably interesting uh, any day you look at it. And I'll, get, I'll say some more about that, how to predict that. Okay, this is the um, sun in, in, uh, at 195 angstroms. And this is a low sunspot period. And this is a high sunspot period. And we can make that do something. There we go. Watch the month roll by. In high activity times, the sun has, tends to have two bands, you can see those here, two bands of sunspots. And um, it's fairly complicated because the top of the sun spins more slowly than the equator by four days. It, if that was the case on the Earth, Fairbanks, Alaska would arrive at noon tomorrow four days after Quito, Ecuador. Fairbanks, Alaska would swing around to noon four days after Quito did it on the same day. It would be the same day on some kind of line that went like this. And you'll see that on the sun over a long period of time. The, the bands will go like this and then snap at the 11-year cycle, at the bottom 11-year cycle, and the magnetic polarity of the sun will flip. 93 million miles away, 100 Earths, 109 Earths fit across the middle. Not very intuitive. OK, so here we have some sunspot, uh, sunspots. And the, uh, do you want to get ready to play those? They, they don't play? They don't play. Ah! OK. The, the uh, magnetic energy coming up from underneath the convection zone tends to push away the rest of the uh, surface. And um, hmm. well, of course, you're right, Reza. OK. Um, the, the, below that surface of the sun, plasma dominates magnetism. And above that surface, magnetism dominates plasma. So you get two different kinds of experiences on the surface of the sun. Magnetism dominates above, and plasma dominates the magnetism below. If the sunspot was isolated and not included where it is there, but basically taken out and put in space, it would be brighter than an arc light. Those look black, but it's only because of, of a trick of view that it looks black. It's just uh, dimmer, not quite as bright as the sun at, at that layer at 5,000 degrees Kelvin. It would look like an arc light. It's so bright. Oh. The sunspots are, are areas of intense magnetic activity that inhibit convection. So as, as this fills with magnetic activity, the convection that produces all of this, because this is essentially the very top of the convective zone, stops. 
And so you, you look into the sun as it appears to, and there's no convection there, but very, very strong magnetism. Okay, so if you're on a day where you've done some good plotting and thinking and watching spaceweather.com, you see something like this, then turn into something like that over a period of a couple of hours. And there's the apparent, or the, the uh, proportional size of the sun, of the Earth. So there, and the, in the active part of the sunspot cycle, there's some very, very dramatic things that go on. And if you're lucky, you'll see one or two of those. And here is one of those events. I'm sorry, oh, here it is. Doesn't play either, does it? Crumbs. All right. So the, the photosphere being ruled essentially by magnetism, how, how magnetic is it? Well, we, we measure, we talk about magnetism in terms of flux, and, and for these purposes, we'll talk about it measured in Gauss, although it's uh, measured in Teslas. There's such awkward numbers, it's easier to talk about Gauss. So a toy magnet that you might have at home is 100 Gauss. The sun's surface at, at the photosphere is about one Gauss. And a sunspot may produce as much as 3,000 Gauss. So you've not only got 5,800 and some odd degrees Kelvin, you've got 3,000 Gauss of, of flux and, um, and nothing to stand on. It's a vacuum. That's why I say it's, it's not intuitive, and it's a lot weirder than we think it is. Here's a magnetic picture from the uh, SDO of the sun. And I don't know how clear it is there, but, but the SDO has got some very, very good result resolution. You see very fine structures of the magnetic activity going from positive to negative poles. That most of the sunspot activity occurs in pairs, and, and it's um, uh, an obvious magnetic uh, experience with the magnetism carrying the plasma uh, from one pole to the other. Before we had the SDO, we had um, the TRACE satellite, and uh, it gave a little uh, RAR pictures. Let's see if this one goes. We're zero for zero. Um, it, it was the first set of pictures anybody really saw of magnet, magnetic loops close up. The SDO has uh, surpassed that during the writing of this talk. So I'll put it all together, and... Um, the, the next slide here is something more nearly what you'll see in a hydrogen alpha telescope if you, if you get one. This is not an out, a space view. It's a, a view from, from home, basically, uh, a, by a person who has a pretty good-sized telescope and uh, did some image processing because the, while the surface is good, there's a filament here and a filament here and lots of granulation and, and a sunspot and some pelages, more stuff here. The prominences around here don't look as good as they do even in a cheap telescope. The prominences are very, very fine and are, are actually very dim, comparatively very dim, and difficult to get uh, captured on any kind of imaging, whether it's emulsion or, or um, uh, digital. What most people do is take the, their picture of the surface of the sun and then take the outer picture of the prominences and then Photoshop them together, and I'm sure that's what this guy's done. But that gives you, from my eye, from what I see in the telescope, that's more of an idea of what the, uh, the kind of things are that you'll see in a hydrogen alpha telescope on an amateur level. So on to hardware. Um, HA telescopes are, are um, a specialized instrument, and there has been uh, quite a change in the technology. In the old days, you bought a hydrogen alpha filter and put it on the back of a refractor. The sun's rays are F30. So people would do things like make a six inch F20 tele refractor. And then mount the thing. Because most of the viewing of the sun is in kind of an arc like that. And so you frequently found yourself with a right angle uh, uh, adapter laying on the ground, flat on the ground, looking at an eyepiece at the sun pretty much straight up. Very awkward. but. Uh, Worse so because you spend a lot of money on the filter, which in the old days had to be temperature regulated, which meant you had to plug it in. So you go out someplace to view wonderful things and have to plug it in. Uh, and the light cone from the F20 telescope is still not parallel. And, and to the extent that the light cone is not parallel, you destroy the acuity of the filter. So you may pay 20,000 bucks for a 0.35 filter 
And by the time you get it through your F-20 telescope, it may be 0.5, which only cost about 5,000 bucks. Uh, there were some compromises. The, uh, a space company uh, called Coronado Optics in Tucson, owned by David Lunt, uh, started making uh, uh, Coronado telescopes, one of which we have. And they, they changed the, fil the main filter inside so that the, the quartz that they used to make the filter out of was stable. And I think, I think I remember what they did was the earlier ones had two pieces of quartz that were separated by an air gap. And any kind of temperature change in the air gap meant the quartz was bent. Quartz likes to bend, and when it does, things go, out, go crazy. He, he aluminized or put the, deposited the filter on both sides of the same piece of quartz, which made it much more temperature stable. But since both sides of the same piece of quartz had to be uh, 20th wave or so in, in optics, it was very, very difficult to do, and he invented the process to do that. Those telescopes then could be put inside of an F6 60 millimeter refractor, and you put a, a UV and an IR filter in the front. You put a corrector plate to take the F30 uh, uh, light, light cone and make it absolutely parallel, run it through the filter, and put a blocking filter in the back and throw a diagonal up to the eyepiece. So it's very small and very portable and a lot less expensive, and you pay for what you get. You buy a, a 0.5 angstrom filter, and you get to see 0.5 angstrom results. So then you get to the problem like we all do, and, we, and I don't think anybody, including me, ever thinks in this process, but if you're the kind of person, you do visual astronomy, you know, you have an 8-inch... Uh, um, cast a grain and you go out and, and use it every month or every other month and you go viewing, that's kind of what you like to do, then buy yourself a visual hydrogen alpha telescope. But if you know you're the kind that you buy the visual telescope and then six months later you go, well, maybe I need a bigger one. I, it could be brighter. You, know, you start whining a little bit. You start looking at your pocketbook and you find what you explained to yourself is a good deal and you get a better telescope and you keep that for a year or so and you go, well, I don't know. I like to do imaging, I think, but no, I, this thing is, won't do imaging. So you've got to buy another telescope. So you spent maybe, well, I won't say how much, um, and, and moved up. So make your decision now. If you're the kind of person that's going to move up and do something big, then okay, buy the right telescope right off the bat. It's a lot of money. But if you add up the, the train of, of, of eBay uh, optics uh, that, or, or Astromart optics that you've sold off and all that stuff, just start with the right telescope and, 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 and don't hurt yourself. Um, and here's, here's where the money goes. The telescope itself isn't so expensive, but the filtering really is. A one angstrom uh, filter will give you some prominences, pretty good, pretty, eh, pretty good, uh, and very little surface detail, but they're inexpensive because the filters are easy to make. A seven, a seven tenths of an angstrom uh, filter is the one we have. Gives you great views of the prominences and pretty good views of the surface. You can see all the stuff that's on the surface in some detail. And it's not terribly expensive, medium expensive. The uh, half an angstrom, you see lots more detail on the surface. And the prominences start to get, uh, they're okay. They're not quite as good as they are on the seven. You get to three-tenths of an angstrom, and the money really starts to bleed. It, it's, it's thousands of dollars to go to a three-tenths of an angstrom. And you start to lose the prominences, and you get great surface detail. But those are pretty much research grade because they're just, you know, they're very expensive. I didn't price one. I could guess, but I won't tell you. It, you know, unless you are, your Uncle Henry died and left you more money or you won the lottery and have more money than you possibly know what to do with, don't think about 0.3. Okay, think about one of these. This is a PST, a personal solar telescope, originally sold by Coronado, now sold by Mead. David Lunt died, and uh, uh, the, Mead bought the company, and then his son took uh, the company and put it back together. It calls it uh, Lunt Optics. Uh, I don't think they make this, but I know Mead does, and I know what's called Coronado does. It's a 40 millimeter uh, telescope with a little uh, sun aimer. You put it on a photographic tripod and wait till a little white dot appears in the in the finder there, and take a look at the sun. Because one of the problems is you can't get the solar telescope and point it at the sun and sight down the the, the screws like we do at night because things get really bright for a while, not for very long. You have to look the other way. You point the telescope up, and you look at the shadow, and when the shadow focuses, it's pointed at the sun. Okay. Or you get one of these little goodies in the telescope, and it points right at it. This gives adequate views of the sun. Not 
wonderful pictures, but you're going to look at the sun and go, wow, I can see everything I see on spaceweather.com. I see the prominences really nicely. I see the filaments and so forth. My brother-in-law has one, just loves it, and they're 500 bucks. If you get really f frustrated and want to have more selectivity, you can do what's called uh, stacking a filter on the front. They sell a little filter, so it's twice as selective, but it dims down a lot with a 40 millimeter, uh, with a 40 millimeter aperture. PST, best visual telescope you can buy. Then you can take a step up. Uh, you can take a step up. This is uh, uh, one similar to the one we have, a newer model. It's got 60 millimeter aperture. It's got a little star finder here. It's got uh, an adjuster for Doppler shift because the speed of the sun rotating and some other factors, you have to, you, you tilt the filter slightly and you get better views of different parts of the sun. Uh, blocking filter and an eyepiece. This is a, a Lunt zoom eyepiece. The best eyepiece I've ever seen. I've got a stack of Nagler eyepieces I stick into the telescope, the solar telescope, and they work fine. This one allows me to stick one eyepiece in the telescope and go <whistles> until the picture is perfect. Somewhere between 10 and 12 millimeters. And, and, and exactly right. And it does make a difference. One of the things about the solar telescopes is the diagonal and the eyepieces and the, and the front, front end, the cleanliness of the optics and the quality of the optics makes a huge difference. You, you can turn your, your hydrogen alpha telescope into a piece of junk by, by having a very inexpensive star diagonal, you know, the kind you find at the RTMC in the big boxes. Yeah, don't want to do that. You want to buy as a Lumicon, very high quality star diagonal and a good eyepiece. This one is 150 bucks. I didn't think it did that well uh, for deep sky objects, but it did very well, extremely well for uh, solar. The, the price is a little high. I think they sell for 1200 for visual. What the difference is, the blocking filter in the back is six millimeters, and that's the expensive filter. That brings the price down a lot. If you go to the photographic or imaging filter, it's 30 millimeters, and the price can add $1,000 to the price. So when you decide whether you want to do imaging or visual, that's the kind of difference you're going you're gonna to talk about. But if you're the kind of guy that has to have the biggest scope in the, in the hill, Here's the biggest scope in the hill, 150 millimeter high vision alpha telescope. I believe on the wrong mount. I would never mount something like that there. You want to have a driven mount. Uh, you want to have something you can see. Um, I don't know, Altas mount, mounts like that don't really do it for me, but then I'm not going to spend the 7,500 bucks for one of these monsters, although I'm sure the views are wonderful. And if you are uh, favored enough to buy one, uh, don't take what I said personally. Invite me over and let me look at it anyway. Okay, and this is uh, the, the add-on filter, the stacking filter. They sell adapters for it. And uh, you put it on the front of the telescope. The d image dims a little bit, but the selectivity goes down to about the next level. The trouble is this little knob here. This is the secondary uh, Doppler shift. So you've got to get the primary and the secondary Doppler shift and the focus all synchronized so they give you pretty pictures. It takes a little finessing. You have to learn how to do it. Once it gets done, there's a procedure I usually focus uh, my telescope first, then do the Doppler shift on the telescope, put the, the add-on filter on, and, and, and tune that one, and then leave it. The sun will sometimes heat up the front filter uh, and, and cause the Doppler shift to change a little bit, but at least that's the one I know to change. It took a while to figure that out. It's, if you have, like our telescope, uh, and you want to you wanna make it better somehow, the other option is to buy a new telescope. Well, that's a pretty pricey uh, change. Adding a, a stacked filter to it like this makes a big change for not nearly as much money. Okay, so we're down to the wire, and there's a couple of things I would like you to see. You want to hit them? What makes a hydrogen alpha viewing more meaningful is having the right resources. And the first resource is spaceweather.com, and I should probably assume that all of you have looked at it, but I wanted to focus on a couple of things. This is from uh, December 7th. Go ahead and roll it down to... Things like that. People will send in the pictures of what they've seen that day. There's no sound. It's a pity. Isn't it? Okay, and go to the left. Yeah, thank you. Reeve Ghosh has supplied the audio. And go off to the other side. Other side. This whole uh, uh, sidebar is about solar activity. Here's the um, aurora. Going down some more planetary K index. 
interplanetary magnetic field, uh, coronal holes, go down some more. Uh, and re re forecast for flares of M and X class of probability in the next 24 to 48 hours, very, very important. Um, geomagnetic storms, that's for us. And then go, and then, uh, go back up again, all the way up. Aurora, and then the current white light picture, where the sunspots are, what the current numbers are. How many, what's the, go back up a little bit. The current sunspot number, how many there are on the, the uh, it's an index, it's not an actual count. But the index is 35, a number of spotless days. You can tell the, how the solar cycle is doing. Uh, and it gives you some really basic uh, current information about what's going on in the sun. Okay, click on the other link there to um, uh, solar data. Okay, so solar soft. This is a little more subtle uh, uh, site. It's off to the right. It, it has the, the observatories and the cameras that it uses for data collection. And some of it's uh, um, x-ray, some of it's hydrogen alpha, then move down a little bit. And this gives you, if you move way off to the left, the class of magnetic activity. Uh, a, B, and C move, move down just slightly. A, B, and C are fairly quiet. M is a li uh, the lower class of uh, solar flares and coronal mass ejections. And X is where you start to get really active stuff, coronal mass ejections of a, of a larger nature that's that are quite uh, visible. And you can tell by this line in particular how the solar activity is doing because it doesn't just happen all at once. It'll build up to an event. So if you're watching that line over a period of days, you can see something might be coming up. And in fact, right now, nothing happened. <laughs> but, but that's one of your resources to track that and, and uh, see what it might be doing. Now go down a little bit more and you get some more ideas from them about a magnetic flux and direction, solar activity, and move up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, move down. Here's a list of all, move down some more, a list of all the, the recent, stop, all the recent flares. See, we've only had B-class flares, which are really, 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 really quiet, the names and the data and the pictures and all that stuff. So you can look down and see when the last really good event was. and. Uh, in doing that, you get a good perspective on what solar activity is like and what to look for, and you, you um, can get a current picture of the sun and go, yeah, I want to see that. You go outside, set up the telescope, look in the eyepiece, and you know what you're looking at, rather than, than looking at the telescope and finding out later that there was something really cool to look at. And that sounds obvious, but, but looking at the sun is, again, not intuitive. It takes a good long stare to really see what's there. It isn't that just a look at it, oh yeah, oh, that's a cool galaxy, and then you walk away. You sit there and look at it for a while to really see what's, what's in, um, involved in the sun. Okay, then the last one is the Nemesis Solar Dynamic Observatory. No, Solar Dynamic Observatory. Thank you for doing this, Russell, because I have no idea how to run Mac PowerPoint. Uh, this is um, the NASA site for SDO, and it has all the latest stuff from the sun. Maybe there was a shadow over the sun, I don't know. Um, and and what, what they've been reporting, because it has, people are burning their books. It's changed a lot of stuff, and this is where you're going to find what's going on, as well as these really, really, really detailed pictures of the sun that you're not going to see in your telescope, but you can say, oh, yeah, I saw this filament. It was really good. It wasn't quite as far around, though. So um, those three resources, I think, will be the ones that you're going to use the most with your hydrogen alpha telescope. And then the last slide. So we're going to put the presentation on the uh, website so you can look at some details you may have missed or thought of. But in the meantime, I'll entertain any questions you might have. The, the blocking filter? Uh, the question was, I uh, had some sense that you read that the blocking filters tend to burn out. I had that happen in mine. I have a Helios telescope made by Coronado back in the old days. 
I called them up and said, uh, I think the coating's peeling away, letting a lot of light through. They said, send it back. They fixed it, updated the telescope, and sent it back to me, no charge. So, so Lunt, ne Coronado, in my experience, will stand behind their product uh, very nicely, if, if that's a problem. What's the difference between calcium and hydrogen alpha? Uh, cost and, and, and brightness. You're not going to see a lot. Uh, you can image fairly well with calcium, but it, and I haven't really seen it that much, but I've talked to guys who do it. Uh, hydrogen alpha is more entertaining. You get to see stuff more easily, but at that frequency of, of uh, calcium, you're going to see slightly different uh, activity on the sun. No, as I say in the writing of the talk, things have changed. I went, I, I did the stuff on the on the telescopes. I went back and it all changed again. So they may have changed a third time. So the the with the new solar cycle coming on, I'm sure they're in pretty hot competition to have the latest stuff. Yeah, new features, but you're not going to go wrong having the right size blocking filter, which determines some of the cost, um, and uh, the the um, um, shift in frequency, Doppler shift control. Yeah, the, the better the eyepiece, the better the view. The Coronado put out a series of three solar eyepieces. I didn't, I didn't personally think they were that good. The uh, zoom eyepiece is very, very good, in, in my opinion. Now you can argue with me. I have a 7 millimeter Nagler and a 15 millimeter and a 12 that I use, and those are very good. But together, they're pretty expensive. So the, the $150 one is better, at least as good a quality and, and better money spent, I think. Very much so. The best views are in the morning, before, 10, before half, 45 degrees elevation. Uh, the afternoon is usually pretty, pretty windy and wavy. Middle of the day, it's, it's, it's straight up. It's shorter, but it's, it's also more heat's developed and got more motion in the atmosphere. So it is better in the morning, a little quieter. Eyepieces? No, the eyepieces are pretty much standard eyepieces. I think that one, the ones that Coronado put out for hydrogen alpha viewing were coated to accentuate uh, 652 nanometers. Uh, but I didn't think I didn't think they did that much, um, and they were expensive. We don't know. All all we know for sure right now is it's coming up, and fairly fairly steeply. Um, as a solar observer and a radio ham, I'd have to say it's at this point it's pretty typical. Um, we, we won't. I think we need to wait another year or two uh, to really see what it's going to do. But we don't even know what, how long the flat top's going to be or the other side. Yeah. Um, the sun doesn't run on logic. I don't think so. It's it, it's going to do what it wants to do. Uh, it. it uh, like it did for this cycle, and if you look at the at the previous cycles, there were some that were quite typical. Um, there were some that were quite high, and then there was a monitor minimum. There was some feeling that a few couple of three years ago that we might have another monitor minimum. Um, uh, at this point, at least that's not going to happen. Okay, Jim. Sorry. Minimum to minimum, I think, is 11 years. Minimum to minimum is 11 years, I think. Did somebody else have a question? See the Reeve Gauche is quiet. OK.
That's my subjective response. So, so is there something you can say to speak to that? So yes. That you're yes. Recognizing the people, you know, the public, and you can get yes. good news by this. Yes. Buy a lot of tinfoil and make little skull caps. <laughs> And sell them and tell people that, that when, the, when it flips poles, put the little hats on and absolutely nothing will happen to you out of the ordinary. That way you make money off of their stupidity. But giving it some charitable twist, uh, the Sun has been doing that for a good long time and there's nothing at all in the record whatsoever to show that has any effect on the Earth uh, other than bright sunlight. I, I didn't say that the Sun provides, one of the similes is the Sun provides 1,500 watts per cubic meter on the Earth. How big of a space heater do you need at 93 million miles to provide one and a half kilowatts at a square meter? If you can figure that one out. Oh, but does anybody, did anybody figure out how old I am in a, in a galactic year? A second? Thank you, Mr. Babbage. Oh, one second. With, no, there's an OBGYN. How would you figure that? Right after conception. So. Apparently, the twinkle was still in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> You'll, yeah. <laughs> well, that does enlighten my history a little bit. So, good. Well, anyway, that, that sounds like all the questions that we better handle tonight. Again, thank you very much, and uh, bid you good evening. Thank you very much, Doug. I'm sure uh, would you be able to hang out a little bit afterwards if any have yes. Yeah, so um, if any have anybody has a question, didn't get a chance to ask uh, Doug.